So my topic is understanding the pouch procedures and why, why pouches may fail and can we redo or should we not redo failed pouches? I have nothing uh, to disclose as related to this presentation. Otherwise, uh, you know, the, I have a conflict of interest with the SLT NTREC within the last one year. So as was said, the total practical colectomy in a little pouch anal anastomosis is the gold standard therapy. The area that Professor Fleshner talked about there are certain indications we'd like to stage it. If you ask me the number one reason why the pouches fail, respectfully, they were not staged. I feel very strong about this thing. So staging, especially we had two data, that one, the more data that Professor Fleshner talked about, and recently we had a paper with Jin Yu Gu. After six years, we looked at it again, that staging the pouches decreased our cell pelvic septic complications. So I'm very liberal about staging it. I tell the patient that we will see how the tissue qualities look. If they're on biologics, it is not routinely, but high likely the fact that they're gonna be staged. And I'd rather have the patient to give that upset to me for extra six months, they're gonna carry an ileostomy or potential detrimental side effects of the sepsis. Number one reason the pouches do fail, because of leakage. And in our data that we have found over the 4,700 4, patients, by staging them, we were able to mitigate the risk of sepsis and pouch survival. So these are the reasons that was eloquently explained by Professor Fleshner, the reasons why we stage these pouches. So how do you do the pouches? This is something that I learned from my mentor. What I'm describing to you is the most common pouch procedure done in the world right now is a stapling technique, a double stapling technique. You mobilize the rectum, come to the point you feel the anorectal ring, this area. I use the proximal interfalgan joint, the area for transection with a staple gun. So this is the first staple that's being used. Come across with a linear stapler, then subsequently create a J pouch. We use a 15 to 20 centimeter of a flipped over ileum to create the J pouch, come across and close the tip of the J pouch. This is the area we call the tip of the J pouch that may sometimes leak. If there is no leak, then we go ahead and do the anastomosis. When we do the anastomosis, this is a circular stapler and a cutter. So you're gonna get two donuts when the stapler is, after the stapler is fired. It is important to come back of the staple line at the front in woman, there's a vagina that you may accidentally grab, so you gotta be careful about. Why I'm talking about these things? With humility and modesty, this is a high complex procedure that needs to be done, in my opinion, high volume experience hands. This is not a procedure that should be done once a year, two a year, or even 10 a year. You do this anastomosis with this way, you fire it if there is no leak, I give an ileostomy for three months and close the ileostomy in three months' time. This is the simulation of the, what I talked about. You create the J-pouch with the firing of this linear stapler and a cutter that opens the bowel wall between the two segments and it creates the J-pouch itself. Then you come across with the tip of the J-pouch as shown here with another linear stapler and I like to oversaw this area to prevent the potential tip of the J-pouch leak itself. You know, the, before you do the anastomosis, uh, this is the, you do the J pouch, but you come across this area, and then you come across the, uh, that anorectal area, take the rectum out, and you bring the staple gun and have it to come posterior to the staple line by guiding with your finger, and then later on bringing the pouch and then hooking it up to the anvil. Uh, so by this way, it creates a potential area for a double staple and cutting. Then you check for a leak. If there is no leak, then you go ahead and uh, you know, they give the ileostomy a patient for three months. So these are the most common reasons that the patient's pouches do fail. Technical, IPAA leak. Efferent limb syndrome, it was an issue in the past, which we'll explain later. It's related to an S pouch creation, where there's an exit counted. Sometimes the tip of the J pouch leak, what we talked about. The second most common thing, where the diagnosis converted itself to a Crohn's disease, where pretty much we don't have too much to do here. And sometimes we still don't know why certain pouches do prolapse or why certain pouches do get an efferent limb syndrome, which we will talk about, due to the functional defecation-related disorder that causes these pouches to fail. 
But let's talk about why the pouches may feel. This is not like a simple appendectomy because you need to be creative in the operating room to be able to push the limit on behalf of the patient. Not everybody the same, the pouches may not reach. This is a routinely that I take the iliocolic artery and look at this vessel. This is a superior mesenteric artery. Just as lengthening maneuvers, a little ding on this artery may be the end of the procedure where the patient may end up with a permanent ileostomy for the rest of his or her life. So it just needs an expertise to build it, and repetition is the mother of the skills. This is the reach uh, phenomenon. We walk to make sure the things reach. After the reach is done, you make sure the fact that you give the patient the ileostomy. If the J pouch is not a possibility, uh, the God uh, creation of the human being, the S pouch can give an extra length that things may reach. And the S pouch that can be seen here was actually the first type of pouches that was done in England uh, where they published actually the initial uh, high number uh, case series. But it needs to be two centimeter, uh, this exit counted. If you leave it more than two centimeter, it creates the obstructive defecation and the patient then ends up the needing of an elongated big pouch, then they may need to go a uh, redo S pouch procedure because of an efferent, efferent limb syndrome. Again, this is the creation of an S pouch itself, three limb of a 12 to 15 centimeter of a terminal ilium. You sew the things together. And also, life is not perfect in the operating room. You don't know what you're gonna get, like that Forrest Gump movie. It's like a box of chocolate. The things may go wrong, so you need to have the certain, you know, the infrastructure and the communication with the OR nurses to be able to handle these complications in the OR. Double stapling technique, as I have emphasized, still the most common procedure is done. But there's also a demanding procedure where the initial S pouches was done with this technique, which is a mucosectomy, stripping the mucosa and doing a hands-on anastomosis. At the Cleveland Clinic, do we still do this procedure? Yes, in patients with a low-lying rectal dysplasia or cancer. Otherwise, our preference in the setting of the ulcerative colitis or uh, FAP with no cancer or polyps at the anal transitional zone is doing a stapling technique for the sake of the function and a better quality of life. So we're talking about these things. When you do this hands-on anastomosis, the things may go wrong, and you may end up with a permanent ileostomy. It's just the complexity of the situation. So let's talk about the redo pouch. So people ask me, should redo pouch should be a routine? This is my answer to them. This needs to be a patient-driven factor. My point that I tell to my fellows, that if one can accept and live happily with a permanent ileostomy, trying to convince him or her to have an ilioanal pouch is a disservice to that human being. I think that's very important. It needs to be a patient-driven factor. These are the things we talked about, the leak, leak, leak. This is the thing that we always get scared. If someone leaks, it's like, what the hell we're gonna do? It can be very humbling. And redo pouch surgery is a technically demanding procedure. It's time consuming and you need to have the infrastructure. It's not about the surgeon. It's about the gastroenterologist. It's about the radiologist. It's about the pathologist. It's about the psychologist and everybody working you know, the together. And you need to have the technical capability. If the J pouch doesn't work, you can do an S pouch or you can do a hands-on anastomosis and you can be able to do a cock pouch. So you need to have these things in your armamentarium to be able to serve these patients when the pouches do fail. So when the leak do happens that we usually just put this drain in, actually this is still the most common thing, have the things to wait, change the drain every six to eight weeks and come back and try to have the things to close. Most of the time, these things do wait, work. We wait around six to 12 months for this leak to heal, periodic examiner anesthesia, clean that cavity, get a gastrograph and enema. Around 75 to 85 percent of the time, the things do heal. If it doesn't heal, patient may need to go to a redo pouch procedure. Communication on a patient with a complication with the leak is very critical because it's about trust. When they don't get a clear answer without a plan, that's the time that the surgeons get into trouble. You just need to put your heart and tell them what you know, what you don't know, and set the expectations from the beginning after the complications happens and before the complications happens. When these patients do come, one of the things that I do blame are uh, you know, the part of the caregivers, the surgeons, patients get lost. Patients used to have a diagnosis of ulcerative colitis. 
They got leaked, the thing healed up, they closed the leostomy, but patients still have an ongoing leak. And these patients' diagnoses then turn to be, or well, now it's a Crohn's disease, and the patients are sent back to gastroenterologists. And I'll prove you why that's the case with our redo J pouch experience. Then patients are said, you have Crohn's disease now, however, it's a surgical complication. Patients are said that now you have pouchitis, which actually is a surgical complication. Or sometimes they're told that they're crazy, they're out of mind, which is very unfortunate. They're not crazy, they just have a pouch went wrong. So when you deal with these patients, you've got to be humble. And you need to set reasonable expectations. Pouch salvage can be linked to process, and they need to understand the life may not be perfect after this procedure. We combine the evaluation of these patients with careful history. We do get an exam under anesthesia, pouchoscopy, gastrograph, and enema, and MRI. We complement these things. This is pretty much routine. In patients with an anorectal outlet obstructive defecation, they may also get a manometry in these settings. Don't blame on the Crohn's disease. I learned from my mentor, check your own footsteps. If somebody had a complication within six months to a year after the J-pouch, the issues is most likely related to technical or mechanical problem rather than the Crohn's disease. How do we know that? Patients who were re referred to us as a, labeled as Crohn's disease, we were able to salvage 80% or more of them by pushing the limit and just sitting down and listening their history when the things did happen. I think it's very critical. So when these patients come in misery, they're devastated, they're drained. Year after year, this is going on. Cooling off the sepsis is very important. It buys time, improves quality of life, it detoxifies the patients and allows the patient to regain health and sets the stage for a big procedure of a redo procedure at the end. So I'm very liberal about giving an ileostomy first. I wait six months, it detoxifies the patient, and it also psychologically improves the patient and the whole family to be able to handle a much bigger procedure in six months down the line. But like anything else, the art of colorectal surgery to be able to see one or two steps ahead. You gotta be careful where you do the ileostomy. You gotta be at least 20 centimeters from that because if this J pouch you cannot use, you may wanna use this side Flip over, bringing down as a new J pouch. So you don't want to bring the ileostomy here or here. That may really force you to go all the way up if you have to create a new J pouch down the line. When you deal with a pouch, a J pouch that you, you're redoing, and most of the time the issues are related to sepsis, that you got to excise the pelvic phlegma. This is very important. If you don't excise that pelvic phlegma, it's not going to work. You're just going to be shoving the pouch into that septic area. Most of the time, you need to take down that, you know, the stapled anastomosis, remove the mucosa, excise the leak, and you most of the time divert the pouch to have the things to heal up. So this is like disconnecting the pouch, cleaning that area, and then the whole idea is when you disconnect the pouch, you're going to excise that phlegma and a big sinus tract related to the leak. Now we're talking about leak, the most common reasons why the J pouches do do. Uh, to require a redo. Disconnecting, excising that area, 70% uh, of the time we can use the old pouch, 30 to 35% of the time we may need to make a new pouch and doing a good old grandma suturing hands-on technique for the things to succeed. So this is a live action. A patient with a very major sepsis, and this is a drain that was there. The presectal cavity never healed. Trying to disconnect the pouch. You need to be humble. You need to put your uh, soul and heart into this thing, give another patient another chance. This is removing that catheter, and this is that chronically infected area. You need to be humble because one little mistake can be a liter or two of a blood because there are big vessels here it's called iliacs. So this is to be able to excise that chronically infected phlegma circumferentially so when you bring the old pouch or make the new pouch, it helps the things out to be able to, uh, you know, to have the things to come through this uh, area. It can be tough, uh, again, you got to leave the ego at the door when you do these procedures because you don't know what you're going to get into. So this is, as can be seen, how the things are much cleaner. 
We're going to go now to the other side. The white is a good thing. It's a clean tissue rather than this crut, chronically infected granulation tissue. Excising this area is very important to be able to bring the things down. So after you excise the things down, you put the stay sutures down in the perineal approach. By the way, this is the bottom of the, uh, the this is the legs, this is the top. Uh, and then we're just completely excising this chronically infected tissue in this area. So tip of the J pouch lead. Uh, we tried to work with Dr. Shen to close this with a bear claw. Uh, I think it's okay, quite all right to try it, but we need to have some plan if the things don't work out. There is a good amount of patients, these patients may need a repair of this area. But there's nothing wrong to try a lesser procedure as long as the mutual expectations are set and I have Dr. Shen to try to repair these things. If the things don't work out, we take them and repair it. Uh, but in the past, we just used to primarily repair them with a surgical technique because they never healed or doing another staple technique. This is the efferent limb syndrome. When the exit contude is left really long, that's the problem. This needs to be two centimeter. Again, these are the patients who need a redo pouch by excising this exit conduit and bringing that seven centimeter long segment of the exit conduit down to two centimeter. Efferent limb syndrome, which means that the patient has some defecation disorder, had the proximal bowel into the pouch becoming more loose, relaxed, redundant, and going behind the pouch. So that when the stool comes, it's like a dead man's curve, and they have the things to come down here. You just need to go back, straighten the things out. These things has a recurrent nature because we plain don't know why the things are happening. Sometimes it happens because there may be some ongoing sepsis down in the pelvis we cannot prove. So if there is any doubt for an infection, you may have to redo these things again. So this is our paper we just published this year two months ago, presented at the American Surgical in uh, you know, the April. Uh, unfortunately, we have done more than 500 redo pouches uh, throughout the years. I'm saying unfortunately because I think we need to get into at least more of a surgical center of excellence site to me, the J pouch procedure needs to be just like the transplant. You need to have the infrastructure and the numbers to be able to do it. It's personal. It's controversial. I feel very strong about this thing to avoid this because I don't want to be known as doing the redo pouches. I'm very sincere on this thing. <coughs> So primary endpoints is the morbidity of the surgery, proportion of the patients with functioning pouch and ileal pouch function and quality of life. And this is the point I was trying to make. The numbers dramatically increased in the last 10 years. Yes, we do have failures too, so I don't want to give the last impression the fact that the J pouches at the Cleveland Clinic don't fail. We do fail, and uh, we, we can fix those things too. And, but the dramatically number of the, you know, the total numbers, the referral from our outside institution and colleagues has increased. So median age 38 years, referrals, <clears throat> this is the, the frustrating part that I wish most of these referrals needs to be from the surgeons rather than our gastroenterology colleagues for the reason that I emphasized, because the surgical complication then gets blamed to a Crohn's disease or non-surgical issue where most of the time all we need to do is just checking the footsteps when the complications has happened. That is very critical. Uh, most of the diagnoses are ulcerative colitis. The Crohn's disease, sometimes pushing the limits, sitting down and talking to the patient, and we do have around 50% successes on these ones. I don't want to advocate the fact that we do J pouches, redo on a Crohn's disease. It's about the intellectual discussion, and our job is just to serve our patients, understanding the limitations and pro cons of the situation. Causes of the, uh, the failure in the primary pouches, again, most of the time, sepsis, sepsis, sepsis. And that's the reason I'm very liberal about staging these procedures. We can use, a, this is the new data around 59% uh, of the time we can use the old pouch, but 41% of the time that we had to use a new one. And you need to be creative. You need to augment the pouch. You need to mobilize the pouch. You need to be creative to give this fellow of human being another chance. The good thing is the results are pretty good. The 10-year survival is over 80%, five years over 9% of these patients. And sometimes it may take another couple times to clean the sepsis. 
uh, I start to be a little bit more liberal. The case that I showed you actually was a second review of a patient that the sepsis continued to happen. We have 16 patients up to 22 right now, the second redo, and the pouch salvage was out of those was like 18 that were still salvaged, which is promising. Sometimes it takes another extra attempt to get there. Life is not perfect, but patients are happy with their outcome. So it's a significant amount of limitations they need to know, and that is very important. This needs to be a patient-driven factor uh, rather than a surgeon-driven factor. So the reoperative pouch surgery, technically demanding, can be done safely with good results, with patient selection, patient consulate, multi-system approach. they are key things to the outcome. This is briefly showing you a little video. Is just You just don't know what you're going to get in these settings. This is a patient uh, that who had a J pouch, and uh, the leaks can happen in uh, multiple places. And what happened in this, uh, uh, you know, the, the patient that when we get in there, there was a... These include leaks from the tip of the J pouch, body, or anal anastomosis, often leading to chronic sinus formation, as well as pouch vaginal fistulas. Acute angulation of the afferent limb at the junction of the pouch can lead to small bowel obstruction. In the following video, we will present two uncommon causes of mechanical pouch dysfunction. So this... This is a patient who underwent a two-stage laparoscopic restorative proctocolectomy with an ileal J pouch, complicated by recurrent small bowel obstructions. As can be seen here, the mesentery overlying the pouch is twisted 180 degrees, causing obstruction of the pouch. Here we can follow the proximal small bowel leading into the pouch. The mesentery is noted to have a 180 degree twist overlying the proximal and distal small bowel, causing an obstruction of the pouch. This obstruction leads to chronic ischemia of the pouch. The mesentery is detorsed, allowing the pouch to lie in its proper orientation. So we detorsed the pouch, unhooked it, and laparoscopy can be concerning because sometimes we don't see. A laparoscopic restorative proctocolectomy with an ileal J pouch who developed pouch dysfunction attributed to anastomotic stricturing. As seen here, the ileum traverses through a retained mesorectum, which encases the patient's conduit on the right and left sides. The encasing mesorectum limits the conduit's ability to expand, often leading to difficulty with pouch evacuation. We will utilize this patient's case to review the... I'm going to stop there for the sake of time so we can answer your questions. It's a great privilege being here, and thank you for listening to me. appreciate it.